Okay, uh, so today we're going to wrap up the other half of uh, bottomland hardwood silviculture. So again, we're talking about primarily extensive silvicultural systems where you're on longer rotations, generally using fewer silvicultural treatments. So we looked at establishing stands um, on old fields or cutover sites. Uh, so what we'll do today is look at managing stands um, that you have mid rotation. So we'll get a lot into the stand dynamics. So let's start thinking about that a little. Um, so go ahead and split into groups and create a diameter distribution for the forest you see in this picture here. Um, and let's start thinking about what that diameter distribution suggests about the age class structure. So again, diameter distributions are going to have tree breaker on the Y axis um, and diameter classes in inches on the X axis. So uh, take a few minutes um, and then when you're done, see if you can put it up uh, small on the board here and we'll take a look at them. Okay, so we've got uh, three different answers up here. And again, it's a picture you don't have real data, so it's understandable. Uh, you can take different interpretations of it. Uh, but what does this diameter distribution on the left suggest about the age class structure of stand? Yeah. It would suggest it's two age. And we can see there's definitely one larger tree kind of in the front left there of the photo and then more smaller trees back there. Um, this diameter distribution in the middle, what would that suggest? Okay, that's generally going to suggest uneven age. And then the one on the right here, okay, that's going to suggest even age. So we've got pretty much all the possible options up here. Um, what we're going to see here with some data today, and we'll talk about more in lab this afternoon, is that it's not always easy uh, to use the diameter distribution uh, to predict the age class structure of a hardwood forest. And the reason for that is simply that you're dealing with a mixed stain. You're dealing with multiple species. So if this was all one species, so if this was all shortleaf pine, where we know it's shade intolerant, you know, based on those different diameter distributions, you would have a pretty good sense of what the age class structure on that stand is. Um, so if it had this reverse J-shaped curve, you would be fairly certain uh, that what you have is an uneven age stand. But what you'll find in mixed stands is that you can actually sometimes have that reverse J-shaped curve, and yet it's still an even-aged forest. And so what happens is the smaller trees may be shade-tolerant species like maples. Uh, they may be mid-story trees like hornbeam, hop hornbeam, dogwood, rusty black haw. And so because you have species with different silvics in that stand, it can be what shapes the diameter distribution uh, more so even than the actual age of those trees. So you really can't confuse, you have to be careful to avoid assuming that tree size and tree age are necessarily the same in a, in a hardwood stand. Again, you go out in that shortly pine stand, the big trees are probably the older trees, the small trees are probably the younger trees, if you have an uneven aged forest, but that assumption is not gonna hold in the mixed stand. Um, so keep that in mind. Get the screen share set back up. Okay, um, so, as we go through hardwood silviculture, let's say you walk into an existing stand, um, you know we can cruise it like we did out at the ballpark woodlot in that lab using that Meadows and Skojak tree class system uh, where you're able to classify the trees by crown class, by log grade, and then you can classify them into desirable, preferred, acceptable, cutting and cull stock. And you can make decisions on whether to remove them in a fin at that point or not. But remember, in order to use that system, you really have to understand not only your markets and you know, what your landowner objectives are and all those factors, but you really need to understand how these mixed stands develop. So you really need to have a firm understanding of stand dynamics, and that's always gonna be a little bit more complex when you're dealing with a mixed stand. So let's look at a few different examples uh, of some data that sort of gets at the idea of why it's a little more complicated in hardwood forests. And so uh, this is some data taken from uh, increment cores um, in a 60-year-old stand dominated by Northern Red Oak, uh, Black Birch, and Red Maple. So this is up in the Northeastern United States. And what you notice, if you just went out there and looked at that stand, it would kind of look like that picture we just looked at, where you have the really large uh, red oaks that are gonna be about 70 feet tall and over a foot DBH. 
And then you have black birches in there that are 50, 40 feet tall, somewhere in that range, red maples that are about 40 feet tall. And those black birches and red maples are five to six inches DBH. So you have many of these smaller trees, a few of these larger trees, but if you start actually increment coring them and looking at the age and how the stand developed, that's an even aged forest. And so they all developed at about the same time. And so that stand might be characterized by a reverse J-shaped curve if you look at the diameter distribution, but it's still even aged. So that's what we would call a stratified mixture, where if you look at this example of the same stand, it's just stratified out over time. Um, if you look in the top one, there's a tiny little person, you know, about two thirds of the way to the right there uh, for scale. But basically just what happened is of these species, the uh, red maples and the sweet birches, Betula lenta there, they grew more slowly and were more shade tolerant by comparison to the northern red oak that was able to outcompete them on this site and get into a, not just a dominant canopy position, but actually a different strata in, in the canopy there. And so you can see now it looks like an uneven age stand, but it's just a stratified mixture. On the other uh, side of the coin here, here you can look at this example in Southern bottomlands. So this is cherry bark oak and sycamore. And what they did in this study is they planted stands on different spacings. Uh, the stands were mixtures of sycamore or cherry bark oak. And then uh, they tracked it out from 1961 to 1985. So it's about 24 year data. And so basically the sycamore won out, which is no, no surprise at all. Sycamores are early successional, rapidly growing pioneer species. So the sycamore did really, really well on this site. Um, and by age 24, these sycamores are like 90 feet tall and 14 inches DBH. So they got big pretty quickly. But look at what the cherry bark oak did. It depended completely on how close they were to the nearest sycamore. Um, so if they were only about 10 feet away, by age 25, those trees are 25 feet tall and about four inches DBH. So they're not even pulpwood sized. Um, but where they were about 33 feet away instead of 10 feet away, now they're in the overstory. They're 75 foot tall trees that are about 11 inches DBH. And so those are already up to the point where they're either small saw timber or pretty close to small saw timber. And so in a plantation, this sort of gets at the idea of you know, what spacing might you need if you're going to mix these trees together? Maybe sycamore is not the best tree to plant with cherry bark oak if you're going on a tighter spacing because it may outcompete it. But this also has take home messages for us in a natural stand. So, in a natural stand, you may have a sycamore regenerating in one spot. And where those cherry bark oak acorns germinate, if they happen to be too close to that sycamore, it looks again like this uneven age stand where it looks like you have much younger cherry bark oaks much older sycamores, but that's not the case. Those cherry bark oaks are intermediate in shade tolerance, so they haven't died off, but they're still very suppressed and they're not growing well. Whereas the cherry bark oaks that germinated further away from those sycamores were able to grow into an almost equal position in the canopy there. So, so another case where if you walked up to the stand and you cruised it, you would think it was uneven aged, but it's actually even aged. Um, this is sort of showing you the, the exact same data, um, but in this case, uh, what they're looking at is just, you know, kind of a, a different way to graph it more than anything. Okay, uh, this study did the same thing, but it compared cherry bark oak with sweet gum. So sweet gum is the competitor. And so what you can see are the bottom two lines are overtop sweet gum and intermediate crown class sweet gum. So they crown classed it there, you know, at the they took this to a much longer time period. They took this out to 70 years. And so sweet gum, some of it got outcompeted by the cherry bark oak. Sweet gum's not as good a competitor against cherry bark oak as that sycamore. But then what you'll see is those top two lines, the one on the far right that's the highest is cherry bark oak with dominant and co-dominant crown positions. The line just below that is sweet gum with dominant and co-dominant crown positions. But the important thing on those two lines is that crossover that you see there near the far left. And so that comes just shortly after age 20. And so, you know, we've seen sycamores planted here on campus. If you plant a sycamore and you grow it out in the open, it gets a very large, very wide crown. It has a decurrent crown form like many of our hardwoods. Um, if you plant a sycamore, or sorry, if you plant a sweet gum and you grow it in the open, 
it's not going to get that wide a crack. It'll still be relatively narrow. And so as a competitor with cherry bark oak, the sycamore, the sweet gum doesn't overtop it. And so that allows the cherry bark oak to catch up to it and eventually outcompete it. But early in the rotation, it kind of looks like you've made a big mistake. It looks like this, where you have those big sweet gums surrounding that cherry bark oak that's significantly shorter. Um, there's a lot of folks favoring this sort of management regime nowadays, because again, I mentioned last class, if you plant a stand of just cherry bark oak, and then you come back 25 years later, oaks really aren't intended to grow as pure stands usually. So you come back and the trees are just terrible in terms of stem form. Uh, you have lots of limminess, lots of forking, uh, pretty low grade saw timber, um, if some of those defects don't degrade it to pulp wood. And so by mixing it with sweet gum, you may have three quarters of this stand in sweet gum, only a quarter of it in cherry bark oak. But now the hope is you carry it out to age 30 or 40. Then at that point, you may be able to go out and thin some of the sweet gum out. It'll get large enough eventually that it's, you know, pulp wood or tie log, railroad tie log sized. And then you carry the fewer number of cherry bark oaks to the end of the rotation uh, where you're able to harvest them. So it may almost be a three to one ratio. Okay, let's look at another example here. Um, this was uh, from, I believe, the Har Harvard Forest up uh, in Massachusetts. And so they, they were looking at this stand and it's white oak mixed with yellow poplar. And all the trees are about the same size. Um, so all these trees are about, you know, 70 to 80 feet tall. Yellow poplar is a little bit bigger, but that's not surprising. Yellow poplar is the pioneer species. It grows very rapidly. But when they took the increment cores on this stand, and so this data goes out to 1980, uh, what they found is that one of those white oaks was in fact 90 years old. It had established in 1870. The other two trees, the yellow poplar and the other white oak, had not established until about 1900, 30 years later. So there's a 30 year age difference in those trees um, that you just wouldn't know looking at them. They actually you know, the, the first white oak that emerged there about 1870, you can see it grows pretty slowly at first. Um, so it established in some sort of small opening likely, grew rap, grew slowly as it was still largely suppressed. And then you had either another timber harvest or New England actually gets hurricanes sometimes, an intense wind disturbance. And that released not only the white oak that it established initially, but it allowed the other white oak and the yellow poplar to establish as well. And then they all start growing at about the same rate from that point on. And so again, even if a stand has, you know, this diameter distribution where it looks even aged, which is what would fit that stand, it doesn't necessarily mean in a hardwood stand that it is even aged. So again, we're seeing this lack of correlation between the diameter distributions and the age class structures. In, um, in our hardwood forests here in the Southern US, Think about our land use history, right? Uh, most things were logged out here in East Texas in the late 1800s, early 1900s, including our hardwoods. And so many of them have since been reestablished as even age stands. So regardless of what the diameter distribution looks like, unless you've got compelling evidence to the contrary, most of our hardwood stands you're actually working in are going to be even aged, whether they look like it or not. So when you're out in one, start paying attention to the species that are smaller if you think it's uneven aged and odds are they're gonna be maples, hornbeams, hop hornbeams, they're gonna be mid-story trees or they're gonna be shade tolerant species. And that accounts for why they're smaller. It's not that they're actually younger in age. So, so unless you have an increment bore, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to tell, um, you know, what the age class structure of your hardwood stand is. So uh, now that we know a little bit more about stand dynamics in hardwoods, you know, we have to start looking at making decisions on managing it. So you cruise the stand with that Meadows and Skojak tree class system. Um, this is the species list out of the useful handouts packet that came from Meadows and Skojak. Um, and this uh, breaks things down into preferred, desirable, acceptable, and undesirable species from a timber perspective. Um, if you wanna manage for wildlife, you can take a list like this and modify it for whatever specific wildlife species you're managing for and adjust it. So you need some list of species, but the list of species might vary by your management objective. If you've got a landowner that wants really good fall color, you know, you can modify a list to help adjust it for fall color. So 
whatever the landowner objective is, you modify the species list. Then uh, you go out and you classify trees. So there in the photos on the left and the right, you see two different white oaks. Which of those white oaks has higher quality? Make them a little easier to see here. Which of those white oaks is higher quality? Yeah, so the one on the left there looks like it has higher quality. You can see the, the white oak on the right there is hollow. It has a big you know, opening in, in the main stem there. So when we say the tree on the left is higher quality, what did we all immediately assume? We assume they wanted timber, right? Um, if you're managing for Indiana bat habitat or you know, some species that can utilize hollow trees, now that tree on the right has higher value. So, um, so it, it depends on the land and objectives, but you need to estimate quality. And then what you do as you've, you know, cruise this stand, you start looking at your data and you start using that Gingrich stocking guide that goals modified for bottomland hardwoods in the South. And so you collect your data and you may summarize it a little bit differently than what you would do with Kitaida. We're working with pine. You summarize it a little bit differently than the standard stock tables um, that you may have produced in timber cruising week or in biometrics or in management plans. So you set up your standard stock tables with those Meadows and Skojack classes. And so this is what one of these standard stock tables might look like. Um, you could have different columns in there. You could use different units, um, but this just gives you the idea that, you know, the different rows, instead of it being pine saw timber, or pine pulpwood, pine chip and saw, hardwood saw timber, hardwood pulpwood. Now what we split them up into, if this is a hardwood stand, we've got preferred, desirable, acceptable cutting and cull stock. That's for our saw timber sized trees. And then we have superior and inferior pole stock. Uh, so that's for our trees that may grow into saw timber size classes, but aren't there yet. And so we summarize them this way. You can get basal area, you can get volumes and board feet, you could get weight in tons, you know, just whatever, you know, works for your scenario. And then what you do when you look at this data, you have to decide, are you going to manage it or do you need to regenerate it? So that's the major fork um, coming out of that box that you see there, okay? And this is one of the more difficult decisions to make when managing hardwood forests. So a lot of what we do with hardwood management comes down to get out in a stand, examine the stand, cruise the stand, look at the data, and make that decision as best you can to meet the landowner objectives. Can we continue to manage our current stand or do we need to start again? And so as we look at this, you know, say you go out and you cruise that stand. Um, that circle up there, above the A line, that's the whole stand. So does that suggest the stand needs to be thinned or not? It needs to be thinned, right? So that circle up there above the A line tells you the stand's overstocked, you're already getting into a lot of density dependent mortality or you're about to get into a lot of density dependent mortality. Um, and so, however, when you look at your data for that stand, see the red X there at the bottom below the B line showing severe understocking? What that red X represents is your preferred, desirable, and acceptable saw timber size trees and your superior pole stock. So when you look at the trees that you actually want to manage on that stand, there's just over 100 of them and they only represent 50 square feet per acre of basal area. And so you can also look the average diameter of those trees is only about nine inches. So they're smaller on average. And so, you know, in the real world, could you go out and thin from that circle down closer to that X and only remove the less desirable trees? If they were spaced perfectly, you could, but that's probably an unlikely scenario. And even if they are spaced evenly throughout the stand, um, odds are that the logger may not be able to get to some of them without harvesting some more desirable trees. And so it's probably operationally going to be difficult to achieve that. And so this suggests that the stand probably has been mismanaged in the past. It hasn't been thinned well throughout the rotation. It may have already been high graded. And so what this suggests to you is, you know, maybe this is a stand where you would be better off just regenerating it now rather than managing it. And so with that regeneration decision, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. 
Um, if you're using natural regeneration, the rule of thumb is that your composition in the new stand will be about the same as your composition in the previous stand. So if composition is the reason that the quality is low in that stand, that's gonna be a difficult problem to fix if you're relying on natural regeneration. Um, you may need to think about artificial regeneration at that point, um, or you may need to think about managing that stand for a period of time. That might be the stand where you start thinking, we're gonna use a shelter wood here and we need to do a prep cut. Let's remove some of these less desirable seed sources, or maybe we need to do a timber stand improvement. Okay, that pre-commercial thin that happens in a mature stand where we remove the undesirable species, we wait 10, 15, 20 years, and then we go in and start implementing our shelter wood operation. So, um, you know, depending on the stand, artificial regeneration might be needed. Prescribed burning might be a decent solution in some cases, in some stands, um, not in many bottomlands, right? Because, you know, they, they have species we want that aren't well suited to fire and it may be difficult to burn them even if you want to. Um, you may have some herbicides that you can go out there and broadcast over the whole stand. I think, I can't remember which class, but I mentioned clear cast uh, to one section last week. And so the, the active ingredient there is a Mazamox. You can spray that over the top of a hardwood stand and get some control on tallow. It's not gonna damage mature oaks. It will kill oak seedlings. But the downside is it's uh, still trademarked. It, it hasn't rolled off the patent yet. And so it's, it's an expensive chemical. So cost is the issue there. And then as you're thinking about this, remember seed tree is not a good solution. Single tree selection is not a good solution. Um, so you, you just basically plan on very slowly fixing any problems you have with composition is what it comes down to. And again, you know, the purpose of these two lectures on hardwoods isn't really to learn much new. It's just to tie all the pieces together, put all the pieces together that we've already learned all semester. So um, we talked about that one cut shelter wood where you may have a natural disturbance in a stand and then you come back in and that natural disturbance essentially accomplished the establishment cut in a shelter wood for you. And so you look around, you do your regeneration survey, you've got good regeneration in the understory. So, you know, you could call it a one-cut shelter wood. It wouldn't be wrong to call it a clear cut either, where you just get lucky. You've got good regeneration in the understory, harvest, and move on. And of course, to do that, you need to do a regeneration survey. So we did a whole lab on regen surveys. You could use stock quadrat. If you're managing red oaks and ash, you could use that method developed by Keith Belay there. Um, and then you could time this, you know, before different thinning operations, after thinning operations, before establishment cuts in a shelter wood, after establishment cuts in a shelter wood, uh, before removal cuts in a shelter wood, before doing a clear cut. So lots of different times when you could go do these regen surveys in a hardwood si system to tell you we are likely to get good regeneration or we're unlikely to get good regeneration. So, And so then if you go back in, you know, this is what your hardwood stand may look like two years after a clean cut, just natural regeneration. Um, and so, you know, you, you've got good natural regeneration out there, your stand's coming back, your regen survey will tell you that. Um, and then you can just, you know, once you see that it's worked, your next step is just wait a really long time. So uh, you don't have to do much at that point. So, you know, if you're deciding to harvest, you, what you do next really depends on, you know, so you've looked at the overstory. You said, oh, this is not what we want. This is not gonna meet the land and objective. This has been poorly managed. We need to harvest. Then the next thing you look for is the regeneration. You know, you hope you get lucky and oak regeneration is favorable, which is those two bullet points on the right there. Um, so from an ecological standpoint, you wanna treat and harvest during the dormant season. How likely is that? If we're talking bottomland hardwoods, you know, these may be two to four month sites where you're not gonna be logging on them in most winters, you would need an exceptionally dry winter. Um, and so that's what you wanna do ecologically, that's probably not gonna happen. Um, and then, you know, you may wanna go out there and do some treatment um, following the harvest to control any residual stems. What you often want with a clear cut in hardwoods is actually gonna be a clean cut. So you wanna take everything down that's two inches and larger in diameter. So you want to try and either pay the logger a little bit more or do a subsequent treatment to remove those stems in the two to four inch size class because you really want that fully exposed microenvironment that's going to favor hopefully your oaks over other species. 
Now, if ochre generation is poor on the left there, um, you can start looking at doing prep cuts in a shelter wood. You can start thinning it for a period of time with the intent of opening up the, the light environment enough. At the end of today, I'll, I'll show you what mid-story removal treatments look like. You might need a mid-story removal treatment, um, but you're doing all these different treatments to attempt to get a pool of good advanced regeneration in the understory. In some cases, you look at underplanting where you, you know, usually after some sort of thinning operation, you go and you plant seedlings in the understory. That's usually a good way to waste a fair bit of money um, because what you're doing is you're planting seedlings into not an ideal micro environment for them. Um, and those seedlings that you plant, they're gonna be at a disadvantage against any sort of root sprout or stump sprout because they just don't have the same root system. So to give you an example in cherry bark oak, what they found in cherry bark oak is that you get very poor survival on underplanted seedlings if the basal area of the overstory is anything over 30 square feet per acre. And 30 is really low. That's, that's lower than you would want to go in even a shelter wood establishment cut typically. So underplanting is usually not viable in this part of the world. But what you may think about doing at that point is are you just going to clear cut and try to plant um, a hardwood plantation there? So that is another option. So as we look into regenerating that stand, uh, again, you can look at that regen survey, but then what you can do is you can go with natural regeneration where you either do that clean cut we talked about. So that's an example of what that clean cut looks like where you don't see any of those smaller stems. Um, in some cases, what they'll do here in East Texas is they'll clear cut a bottomland hardwood stand. They'll let everything sprout back um, and then they may even go in there and, you know, mow the seedlings down, bush hog the seedlings down. Um, and what will happen then is they've developed a good root system. They'll re-sprout, but they're still small in diameter, hopefully. And you get them growing vig vigorously under conditions of intense competition. So hopefully you get good stem forms. Um, you'll see that done in a shelter wood, right? Because think about a shelter wood where you grow the new cohort in partial shade so these probably are poorly formed trees, remove the overstory, mow down all that advanced reproduction, let it re-sprout. And then again, it's, it's growing at a high density, lots of competition, hopefully that fixes any stem form issues. So the clean cutting would be recommended. Now, if you go east of the Mississippi River, they really have a hard time regenerating oaks and bottomland hardwoods uh, using a clear cut or a clean cut. You really don't see that recommended. And so east of the Mississippi River, it's going to be almost exclusively um, shelter woods uh, that they're looking at to regenerate hardwoods. Uh, the, the clear cutting, at least for oaks, just does not seem to be as effective. The other thing you'll often see, and we'll see an example of this this afternoon, is going to be patch clear cutting. And so you can cut in 10 to 50 acre openings, you know, and this has a lot of advantages from aesthetics, from wildlife. Um, we'll see again an example of this this afternoon. Now, how patch clear cutting differs from patch selection, it's really just semantics. Um, and so if that whole rectangle of a photo there was one stand, this would be patch selection. But what you do to call this patch clear cutting is you just say those areas we harvested out, that's stand A. The areas we didn't harvest, that's stand B. And now we know from our definition of stand, it's supposed to be contiguous. So you break that part of the definition a little bit, okay? Uh, but as we, you know, look at modern silviculture and how complex it's become, you know, you, you really see more and more people breaking that contiguous part of the definition of a stand. And so it's, it's just simpler bookkeeping. Uh, you can tell the loggers they're doing a clear cut. Uh, the foresters are more comfortable talking about clear cutting than selection. I mean, would you all rather have a quiz question on clear cutting or on a selection system? Probably clear cutting, right? It, it's more straightforward. So it just, you know, it, it communicates that a little more simply to a lot of different folks. So. And then there's uh, the law of oak silviculture. This comes out of the Appalachian. But if you're standing in a 10-year-old stand and you're thinking about regenerating it, you're 20 years too late. And so you really, you know, like we talked about last class, you really need to be thinking about advanced regeneration throughout your rotation when you're managing for oaks. And you really need to be thinking about that well before you attempt a shelter wood or a clear cut um, or anything along those lines. So, and you know, we, we've attempted all sorts of different things with our hardwoods in the South and many of them haven't worked. That, that's what single tree selection looks like 
um, in bottomland hardwood management. And what you see in there is a stand that has a lot of small diameter trees and low quality large diameter trees. So single tree selection typically has not worked for us at all in our southern hardwoods. Always seems to lead to high grade. Okay, so the, the next thing I wanna look at here a little bit is diameter limit cutting. Um, and I wanna make clear, remember we talked about our selection systems and we had the different regulation methods to implement them. And one of those was our volume guiding diameter limit tool. And with that, remember what it was designed to do is a forester has a paint gun in their hand and they're using a diameter limit, but it's flexible. So they can keep a good tree above their diameter limit and cut poor quality trees below their diameter limit. And they're just keeping a running tally of how close they are to marking the volume they need to mark in that stand. So it's a tool to help a forester mark a stand. Strict diameter limit cutting is when you just tell the logger cut everything 13 inches and larger. Okay, there may not be a forester involved in the operation. Hopefully there's not a forester involved in the operation uh, because this really tends to lead to high grade. And so let's, let's look at a little bit of data on what happens with diameter limit cutting. This is what a stand might look like after a di diameter limit cut. And so you can see all that's left was the unmerchantable species and then the trees smaller than that diameter limit that were probably in suppressed or intermediate canopy positions and just are never gonna be good trees. So, so diameter limit cutting is cutting everything uh, bigger than a certain diameter and that diameter limit is fixed. And so what we tend to see with diameter limit cutting um, is you know, you're know you not doing anything in those smaller size classes. You're not tending them. You're not removing the poor quality trees or the undesirable species in the smaller size classes. So this is kind of the opposite of silviculture because the focus is solely on what's removed and it's not on what's retained. So it does tend to lead to high grade. And so that this then tends to lead to a lot of different problems. You reduce stem quality. Over time, you reduce merchantable volume in that stand to the point you do this a time or two and you go back in there and there's just nothing to harvest. Um, so you've shifted, I've seen stands up in Wisconsin, they've done this to the forest service intentionally as a demonstration area. And you go into those stands and it's just a whole bunch of hop horn beans. And then you go into the other areas they're managing with appropriate silvicultural systems and a focus on what's retained. And it's nice big saw timber sized sugar maples. So it's, it's really night and day. Um, you may shift composition in a way you don't intend to or want to. In our area, what it's gonna do is it's gonna shift composition into all these mid-story species. That's what's gonna happen. Um, you're gonna end up with a red mulberry hop hornbeam stand basically. Um, you're going to have gaps in the canopy that, you know, you, you can see in that area, you are wasting growing space and you're going to shift your diameter distribution unfavorably. So if we look at some data on diameter limit cutting, uh, this was done up in the Northeast. Um, and so what they did is they compared three entries. So think about these as if you've written a prescription for a whole rotation. And in one of them, you go in and you do a diameter limit cut every time. And in the other one, you go in and you do a crown thin. Um, where you're focused on crop tree management, leaving your best crop trees till the end of the rotation and really growing them well. And so what you see on that first entry on the left, you have higher saw timber volume removed and higher value removed. So this is how loggers sell this operation to landowners, okay? It will get them more money today. And so that's how you sell it to landowners. But then start looking what happens at that second entry and at that third entry. That's the longer term perspective of forestry where the diameter limit cutting, it just gets worse and worse and worse. The silvicultural approach just gets better and better and better in terms of volume you're removing and value that you're removing. And actually by the end, you end up removing more value and volume disproportionately with that silvicultural approach. And you'll notice why you only remove a little bit more volume, you remove almost twice as much value it's because you took those best trees and you grew them into really nice saw timber. And so that's where the disproportionate value comes from. And so here's you know, similar data, but instead of a crown thin crop tree management approach, they tried single tree selection. But again, this was in the Northern US with sugar maple where single tree selection is a good silvicultural system for the species that they have. And so if you look at the left, you know, what they removed in a harvest versus what's still left standing out in their forest and inventory, there's nothing left. Uh, diameter limit cutting has removed everything on the left there. Whereas with single tree selection, you've removed about half the value. You still have about half the value out there in that stand. 
And then you look at the difference in that graph on the right. Um, basically with diameter limit cutting, you have very little large saw timber and a lot of small saw timber. It's the opposite with the silvicultural approach where you end up with lots of large saw timber um, and very little whole size trees or small saw timber. So uh, diameter limit cutting uh, tends to, you know, shift your composition and reduce your value. So you really want to avoid that. Okay, I'll post the slides so you can see this a little bit better, uh, but this is out of a University of Tennessee Extension publication that Wayne Clatter book put together, but it, it's a pretty helpful table to look at to help you make decisions on what to do when you walk into that mid-rotation hardwood stand and are trying to make a decision, should I manage it or not? And so the different columns are just looking at whether your species are acceptable or unacceptable, whether their stem quality is good or poor, and whether the trees have a vigor and age that's you know vigorous and young, poor and old. Um, and then the different rows are looking at, is regeneration adequate? Is it currently inadequate, but you think you can get there? Or is regeneration inadequate? And within the boxes in that table, then it just breaks this down into all these different treatments we've been describing. So what do you need to do based on what your overstory looks like and what your regeneration potential looks like? So. I'll post that so you can take a look at it, but it's a good handy, you know, it puts a lot of what we've been talking about onto just one page uh, there for you. Okay, so that, that's what happens when you walk in there and the stand is not of high quality, you need to regenerate it. And you can see, I really didn't go over classify the site and then plant it, because that's honestly no different than what we talked about last class. Um, so that would be the same process you see in the top right there. But let's say instead that you walk into the forest, you cruise it using that Meadows and Skojack system, and this is what you find. Um, that again, your stand is overstocked, density dependent mortality is occurring or is about to occur. Uh, but then when you look at what you have, you've got about 125 trees in those uh, different categories that you want, the trees you want to grow, and they total about 80 square feet per acre of basal area. So again, you may not be able to cut exactly from the circle to the X, but when you do a commercial thin out on this stand, you can probably leave enough of those good trees out there well distributed throughout your stand to the point that this suggests you can manage it. And so this is a stand now where you're thinking about, okay, let's thin it, let's continue managing the stand we have till the end of the rotation and we're not gonna regenerate it today. And so when you start thinking about managing for mid rotation and hardwood stands, um, you are going to let them, if they've been naturally regenerated, you are going to let them go through a more prolonged period of stem exclusion than you would see in a pine stand. And it's because our hardwood trees don't tend to have one straight stem. They tend to fork. Um, they tend to have those wide branching crowns. And so we want to grow them at high densities under intense competition for a prolonged period of time because that's going to get us the high quality saw timber trees. They don't tend to self prune as well. So again, this helps with that also. And so typically we're not thinking about thinning a hardwood stand until we have one and a half to two clear logs. So you want these trees self pruned up to about 33 feet um, is what you would be thinking about. And so that's an 18 year old hardwood stand. And you can see that stand is still too young to be thinned. And so if you go into a hardwood stand and you've got a pine plantation time frame in mind, it's not going to work. Um, they're just not growing as fast in height as we would tend to see in our genetically improved pine. None of these trees are genetically improved. They haven't been through a breeding program. And then you also have to account for the fact that we're trying to get these things established at two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 stems an acre. And so it's gonna take them a lot of density dependent mortality to get down to 200, 100 trees per acre and allow those diameters to really start growing it, it more rapidly. So keep that in mind. Now, when you go in to do the thin, you know, we've talked about all the different types of thinning. Crop tree management might be a good approach. In a younger, earlier stand, a low thin might be appropriate for that first thin. So there's lots of different options. You can use that Meadows and Skojack system to mark your stand for your thin and do a free thin. So there's lots of different options for things, okay? Um, and we talked about this last class. When you do those thins, try to reduce competition from less desirable species, make the oaks more competitive, and anywhere possible, do both of those things. So really, when you're thinning hardwoods, be focused on your next stand, okay? Um, what I wanna wrap up this uh, second hardwood lecture with is just looking a little bit at mid-story removal. Um, and this is uh, sort of a, a type of pre-commercial thin typically uh, that's a little more specific. We haven't quite talked about this yet. 
Um, but what the whole purpose of a mid-story removal is for, it's to improve your regeneration on a site. So this is a site where you probably have oaks in the overstory, and then you have a lot of red maple and other less desirable species in the mid-story. And then you look underneath that mid-story and there's no advanced regeneration. So you wanna go out mid-rotation, you know, at least 10 years probably before you're gonna do a, a regeneration treatment in the stand. And you wanna go ahead and remove the mid-story out of that stand. So you can do this, you know, with any sort of equipment, but commonly hack and squirt is the most straightforward way to do this. Um, so that's a stem that's been hacked and squirted. Um, I, I took that picture at a property in Kentucky. Um, and you can see, you know, these foresters really wanted to make sure the hack and squirt operation went well. So that tree has blue paint on it too. So they actually went through and they marked the trees that were then going to be hacked and squirted. Um, so they did this in two passes, a lot more labor intensive than just doing the hack and squirt in one pass. But if you're on a longer rotation as they were in this case, and you're looking at managing for high grade white oak where they're using them for, you know, barrels, stave production, um, they're using them for high quality saw timber, a little bit of veneer there in that area um, where they're peeling the, the highest quality trees, they're peeling and making thin sheets that might go on tables like this. Yeah, Katie. It's, it's kind of accomplishing the same thing as a low thin, except in this case, um, you're not gonna be removing that many trees and you're not gonna be removing that much basal area. You're only taking out about 20% of the basal area, right? So that would be like a low thin where we took a pine stand from 100 square feet per acre down to 80 square feet per acre. And so you can see, you're not gonna get a whole lot of growth response in the overstory from that, right? So if you wanna think of this as a low thin, you really probably are thinking of this as a grade A or a grade B low thin. But usually the trees you're removing in the mid-story are so small, they're not even merchantable. Okay, so that's what makes it different from a low thin. A low thin is typically a commercial harvest being accomplished with harvesting equipment. This you could do with hack and squirt. So it's really just a, a pre-commercial um, release operation. But what you're trying to release isn't the overstory. You're trying to release that new cohort of regeneration. And so th this is actually just one photo. I just put a white line right down the middle of it. But we were looking up at this hillside and they had done the mid-story removal on the left, but not on the right. And so you can just see the, the total night and day difference there where you have no seedlings on the right. And on the left, you have a whole bunch of different oak seedlings, yellow poplar and other species. And so this was just a few years after that mid-story removal and it worked. Um, the the mid-story they had removed, those trees were still standing. They hadn't even fallen down yet, but they were dead from the herbicide application. And so just more light on the forest floor, and there you go, you've got the new cohort regenerating there. Um, so with the mid-story removal, you know, as with all our silvicultural treatments, there are correct ways to do it and incorrect ways to do it. So there's two examples of correct ways to do it where they remove the whole mid-story um, with the light gray trees, kind of harder to see on this projector in this room. You may remove um, some of those intermediate crown class trees also, if that makes sense, but you can see they're not creating openings in the canopy. If you create an opening in the canopy in, in that part of the world where we were looking at this example in Kentucky, you're gonna get yellow poplar growing into it. So they're trying to have enough shade that they suppress the yellow poplar, um, but enough light that you start growing those seedlings in the understory. And then here's a couple incorrect applications of the mid-story removal. And so if you're taking out big uh, sections of your stand that aren't mid-story, that's not really a mid-story removal. And, and again, the issue there is you're gonna be shifting composition maybe to some of those pioneer species that are gonna be less desirable in your situation, so. Any questions on uh, hardwood management? Yeah. 